Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Shirk. I am a 1986 graduate of EMHS and I work in the field of peace building. I taught for 20 years at EMU and today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, the digital peace factory and how I'm working now with social media in thinking about how to uh, stop violence, prevent violence and build peace. I'm gonna shrink myself down here so you can see my slides. I've worked all over the world. And so I just wanted to give you a brief little background into the varied roles that a person who works on peace um, can play. Uh, in addition to teaching at EMU, I worked with the US military teaching military leaders at West Point, at the Pentagon about the field of peace building. Um, this was primarily between about 2005 and 2015. Um, so I was going back and forth from military academies here in the US and also over to Afghanistan and to Iraq. Um, and really they were interested because the war was not working. Uh, they were thinking about what are the ways that people go about building peace in society. So I was bringing lessons from South Africa and Guatemala and Kenya and many of the other countries where I've worked. I also brought delegates from these countries to Capitol Hill. You can see us here. This is a group of um, people that many of them were EMU students. Um, and we went to Capitol Hill to talk to policymakers there about what they should support about peace. I also did work in the city of Richmond, Virginia on race issues in the city over the last many decades. I grew up in, in Richmond, so it was great to be back there working with the mayor and the city leaders. Just brief photographs from my time at EMHS. Again, this was 1986. I loved being in choir. Uh, this was the day we graduated. Many fond memories of my time there. When I was a student, I often led the chapel program. So this is not unusual for me back to be back and, and giving a chapel. Um, and really, you know, what I valued about my education at EMHS was learning how to put faith into practice. And for me, um, the field of peace building really lets me do that in terms of thinking about how do I live out the things that Jesus was teaching. And one of the sermons that I gave or one of the chapels that I gave when I was a student was about the prayer of St. Francis because it was really motivating to me at that point in my life and it, it continues to be today. The prayer goes, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred, let me sow love, where there is injury, pardon, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, let me bring light, where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O divine creator, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, and to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to eternal life. So as I interact with all kinds of people in this world, from military leaders to conservative religious leaders, to Washington policymakers, um, and to city leaders in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I think these words really apply regardless of who I'm talking to. The big ideas of the field of peace building really are based on these two ideas of dignity versus humiliation. So we think of human beings really all wanting dignity. And so uh, it's a common human need that everyone has to feel a sense of dignity, feeling recognized by others as a full human being. On the other hand, what often drives conflict, and I heard this term in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Richmond, Virginia, on the streets, what drives conflict the most is a sense of humiliation, feeling that others do not see and value your human dignity. Um, and so often people will resort to violence when they feel humiliated. So often you can kind of just think about peace building as trying to overcome humiliation and to build dignity for everyone. Is peace even possible? I often get this question. <laughs> 
And, you know, for me, it's pretty obvious. There are some countries in the world where people are far more peaceful and happy than in other countries. And even within the United States, there are some states that are happier and more peaceful than other states. So how we design society matters. That's, that's kind of how government is. I'm a political science major as well. So I think about what does the government do? How does it operate? Is it transparent? Is it accountable to people? Um, so how you design society matters, but then how individuals within that society think about others, you know, within the family, sort of, we need to reduce childhood trauma, we need to be supporting families, we need to be individually thinking about how we treat everyone fairly, and we need to pay attention to history because it continues to shape our present, especially here in the U.S. So when I was finished with high school at EMHS, I went on to college where I studied political science and peace and conflict studies for seven more years after high school. And really what somebody who's studying peace and conflict studies or peace building, you're studying what causes conflict and violence and really how to design society to be more peaceful and just. Today, my primary job is to work at the Toda Peace Institute, which is based in Tokyo, although I live and work here in the Shenandoah Valley. I'm a senior research fellow, and I'm showing you a picture here of Tokyo. So when I, I go to Tokyo once a year, and this is what the city looks like. This majestic mountain is right outside the city, and it's a, it's a very, very large city. And I meet there with a lot of technology companies like Facebook and Google, as well as a lot of Asian technology companies. And my colleagues at the Toda Peace Institute um, work with me in terms of thinking about how is social media increasing conflict around the world? What is social media doing to our brains? And how is it affecting our relationships with others? Um, I also go out to San Francisco to the Silicon Valley where all the big tech companies are based here in the United States. Um, and I was there in the spring of 2019 at this conference at the Center for Humane Technology, which is an organization um, made up of people who used to work in the technology sector. So this is Google's top ethicist, Tristan Harris. And he was giving a presentation where he was just talking about how how much influence technology has on our lives. So each of us spends about a fourth of our life in this artificial social system online. What researchers are finding is that um, Facebook in particular is affecting the way our brains work um, in a way that is similar to cocaine. So when we're on Facebook, there's this addictive quality where actually it has been programmed understanding neuroscience so that we stay longer and longer on the platform. The colors they choose, the way the layout and the algorithms which drive what they show us um, tends to be toward extreme emotions like anger and fear. So the more things that they show us that make us angry and fearful, the longer we will stay online. Um, and so it's really important for us to realize what is happening with our brains on Facebook. Psychologists have been studying how much depression, specifically among teenage girls, but also teenage boys, has increased with social media. So basically since the onset of social media around 2009, 2010, basically every year it's getting to be uh, more and more depression among teenagers. Um, and it correlates also with how many hours a day people are spending on social media. So the more, the, if you're spending more than five hours a day, almost 40% of girls who spend that much time on social media uh, are showing symptoms of depression. We also know that um, social media is a place where hate is being spread. And again, it's partly the algorithms of the technology companies that are trying to show us things that make us fearful or hateful towards others. Uh, there are some people call them outrage machines because they're just feeding stuff to us that um, either denigrates other people or denigrates us and riles us up in that sense of humiliation so that we're trying to redeem our dignity. 
Uh, approximately one third of online harassment appears to be a result of a specific minority group, racial, ethnic, religious, gender identity. Uh, Muslims, Hispanics, African Americans, Jews, they get a lot of hate on social media. Um, and many Americans are very concerned about this. More than half of Americans believe that online hate and harassment are making hate crimes more common. So it's not just happening online, it's translating into more violence actually in our lives. The other really dangerous thing about social media is that because those algorithms are trying to show us things that make us upset, that make us feel humiliated, actually. Um, often they're, they're lies, uh, things that other people have made up that are not true. In fact, I would say often my Facebook feed includes a hefty portion, 10 to 20% of things that are lies. And that's mostly with well-educated people who are filtering out a lot of the regular lies. Um, but what the Wall Street Journal found is that lies travel on social media at about twice the speed as the truth. So two stories, one true, one false, if you're measuring those stories on social media, the false story is spreading, is being shared virally far faster. And so for many people, their social media feed is primarily made up of things that are not true. It's false news. Um, and that is really distorting our society. Uh, I wrote a whole book here with a group of other people on how social media is impacting conflict and democracy all over the world. We call this book the tectonic shift, meaning social media is really profoundly changing how people are relating to each other around the world. One of the projects that I run is the Digital Peace Factory, and that's what I'll spend the rest of my time today describing. The Digital Peace Factory is a competition to create digital content um, to promote peace building skills and social justice values. So the idea was we invited people who know a little bit about peace building or trying to build better relationships between others to submit memes to sort of mobilize and empower people to be change agents and polarized online spaces. So on social media, on their Facebook feeds when they're getting so much either hate against another group or things, posts that are trying to rile up our own sense of humiliation. Um, how do we start to combat that with digital content like this one that's talking about validation and empathy as a way of lowering your opponent's defenses and of thinking about how we engage with other people. I worked with all these different peace building organizations. So maybe you haven't heard of this. The Center for Justice and Peace Building is just there at EMU. It's one of the best and largest peace building centers in the world. Search for Common Ground is the biggest peace building organization. They're working in 112 countries. They have hundreds and hundreds of staff working for them, creating this kind of digital content all over the world. The Alliance for Peace Building is a group I work with in Washington, DC. New Gen Peace Builders are a group of teenagers, high school students, college students working on peace building. Uh, there's the Listening Campaign, the Plus Peace Campaign, the Build Up Campaign. There's just so much going on in terms of thinking about digital peace building. What we really care about is the fact that social media is impacting divisions in the United States. And often it's memes and gifs on social media that are being used to further divide Americans from each other. Um, so the US Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, which is part of what Congress does, they study issues. And this was a committee led by Republicans that also included Democrats. It was a bipartisan committee. And they found that Russia had used social media to increase polarization in the US and undermine the election back in 2016 as a method of cyber warfare. And Russia's primary method of spreading division and hate in the US was by memes. They would create Kermit the Frog memes that would denigrate a certain group or make somebody else feel upset as if they're, they were being humiliated. 
And the whole goal of Russia is really to divide the United States. It's their national strategy. As somebody who studies international relations, this is very well documented. It's not just in the United States. It, it's also all over Europe um, and in many other countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America. Where, where Russia is destabilizing the world and it's undermining democracy um, in, in any country where democracy seems to be working. So we have a lot to overcome. And the idea of the digital peace factory was that we would use peace memes to try to combat these really divisive memes that denigrate other groups. Um, so we were trying to sort of foster this idea of how do we be excellent to each other across the political lines? Um, how do we depolarize US politics? How do we emphasize kindness, empathy across those political divisions? And partly we wanted to challenge people to stop thinking about either this or that. Every, you, we don't all have to be categorized. Um, we can really try to find the common ground on the things that we believe in together. We had over a hundred entries to the contest and each of these entries um, is also reflecting the idea of the contest. This was actually the winner of the contest. It received the most votes. We had online voting back in no November and December. Um, and this is the meme that got the most votes. So here is somebody preparing to engage in respectful political discourse with my neighbors online, really trying to communicate the idea that if we are more deliberate and careful in what we post on social media, um, this could be beneficial to our country. Some of the memes that were entered really tried to emphasize key messages, skills, and stories of social justice and peace building. Around Thanksgiving, this meme, uh, someone posted, you know, just trying to coach people to how do you talk to family members or friends in a heated political season? You know, how do we ask people to share the experiences that shape their beliefs? How do we try to find common ground in shared values with other people? The contest, this, this submission to the contest was really dealing with uh, the idea of cancel cult culture and how do we address sort of people wanting to raise critical issues. Um, and this African-American professor, she talks about calling in as opposed to just calling out. So calling out is publicly shaming another person for behavior deemed unacceptable. Uh, whereas calling in is trying to talk to somebody in private if they've said something that upset you. Um, it involves compassion and context. And, you know, it's really the idea that listening is an effective uh, strategy for engaging with people across political lines. Some of the memes like this one that was entered uh, captured the essence of this tension between social media advocating for social justice, uh, human rights, Black Lives Matter, and on the other hand, avoiding po polarization that's not necessary. So um, we do disagree on issues and that is in a sense polarizing, but how do we disagree about the issues while still seeing the humanity of others? This meme um, was just trying to sort of get this idea of don't let the ugly in others kill the beauty in you. A lot of the meme creating apps let you take photographs, turn them into comics like this one, and you can put in these kinds of statements. So creating memes on the web is now very easy and actually very fun. And thousands of people engaged with these memes or gifts by liking, sharing, or commenting on them. So in closing, I would just like to invite you all to join us. Um, you can find the Digital Peace Factory on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Um, and if you just join us by liking us or sending us uh, a note, um, you'll get an announcement when we start the next uh, season of the contest, which will be later this spring. And we do give cash prizes. The highest prize last uh, in the fall was $500. Um, and then we, we gave out one $300 prize for second prize, and then we gave out 10 $50 prizes. So it's an easy, cheap way to make money. And I want to close with that. Thank you. Um, you're welcome to send me an email if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for your attention.
Bye.